Worship is not music, is it? Church is more than just services, just the things we do at the services, isn't it? But sometimes we forget about that because we become familiar with what we do. But just as uh, Angus was singing there this morning, I just it really was um, that heavenly atmosphere Neil was talking about. And it's so beautiful and so special. And then it's so easy to get caught up into. And I like that place because when we get there, I start to see things more God's way than my way. And that's the beautiful thing about being a believer is you can get in that atmosphere. And I believe this week coming up, these, uh, these dates of conference that were up on the screen, I think we're going to have a really beautiful atmosphere of heaven. I think we're going to have a very beautiful anointing of God is going to move around. We, just, we need to go ahead and get ourselves ready for that now. Just be flexible. Loosen up. Open your mind maybe. You know, Just uh, get your mind off some of the things that, that, that you're doing in your job or in your day-to-day life. And just begin even now to begin to focus on what God wants to do. It's all about what God wants to do. And so I'm just really looking forward to it. And Angus, I really think you started it off this morning. At least you did for me. And uh, so as we got into that, that atmosphere, I just sometimes, you know, because I'm a little bit prophetic like, like all of us are, I just start to see things. And one of the things I saw was just the beautiful thing that God was beginning to do uh, in this season of Angus's life. And I love stuff like that. I live for that. When I was a young man going to Bible school, I, I was out, I got up one night and went out into the, uh, the little living room we had in the apartment we lived in to, uh, to pray, and I fell asleep. I started praying, I fell asleep, and somewhere in the middle of the night I was awakened because I had the, uh, the Christian radio station on in the background, and I was awakened uh, by something the man was saying, and, and when I became conscious, the only thing I heard was this phrase the guy said on the radio, there are some teachers in the body of Christ, and there are some builders. And as soon as he said that, I'm sure he was talking about something completely different, but the Lord used what he was saying to speak to me. As soon as the man said that, the Lord said to me, you are a builder. And that was one of the first times, it wasn't the first time, but it was one of the first times that the Lord spoke to me. And back in those days, the Lord was training me, just like he's trained all of us, how to relate to him. And he does that by teaching us to hear his voice. Aren't you glad? <laughs> And and I like the fact that he likes to catch us unaware. This thing called Christianity is a mysterious thing. And if we're not careful, we can cause it to become a common thing. It can become just another aspect of our life, and we've got to be careful about that. The Bible warns us about having a hard heart or having other things occupy the place in our heart that God, God... The heart of man is the place God created us that He could occupy. It's a funny thing, the heart. can't get into all the details of it. Not, I don't know if anybody knows exactly how it works, but something about the heart is that center, that core of a person. And God likes to work down in there and then work His way out. Everything that God does in the earth doesn't start on the outside. It starts on the inside. I think that's what's happening in the church. A lot of the things that the Lord's been doing, they're just, just ahead of us. They're going to begin to come out. Some of the things that you have not understood about who you are and what God called you to do and how He made you, those things are going to begin to come out. Maybe some of the things that you did understand, the Lord spoke to you like He spoke to me all those years ago, but you never really saw that too much. I believe in this hour that we're living in, you can begin to expect to see some of the things the Lord has promised you will begin to surface. All those years ago, the Lord said, You know, just let me hear the guy say, there's some teachers, and I love teachers, and I love teaching. I'm tempted to be a teacher sometimes, but I'm not very good at it. Bobby shakes her head like, no, no, no. Stay away from that. Teaching's great because we love the Lord. We love to know about the Lord. We want to know about Him because we know Him. But He said to me way back then, you're a builder. And it was just setting the course for my life. And now looking back all these years later, I see the way the Lord has used me is to help build people. And that's what you can expect probably to happen here today or whenever I'm up here uh, speaking, uh, as long as God's in it. What He'll be doing is using the builder in me to build the call in you. That's what's going to happen this morning for some people. For some people, the call is going to be awakened. All of a sudden, you're going to go, man, I'm called. (laughs) I wasn't really thinking about it. I didn't really realize it. My mind was somewhere else. I've been living life, and all of a sudden, God has invaded my space to remind me I am called. We've talked, I think, before here, and I was preaching last week about the church and how the the word church is not a great word. Uh, This English word that we use is not a great word for the concept in the Bible. 
In fact, it doesn't make any sense. It's a weird, it's a strange word. Just go do the etymology on it and you'll, you'll see what I mean. It's just it's a strange word. It's just a thing we say. The real word for church and what we do together is call. We're the called out ones into a public forum. God's got a hold of us. God's got a plan for us. And he puts us together and he uses each individual member to start working something together that's bigger than all of us. And it's the thing that's bigger than all of us that God really falls upon with the Holy Spirit. It's when we get together, we're, we're anointed individually, but when we get together, that's in the Bible when you see, man, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And 3,000 were saved, and 5,000 were saved, and special miracles happened. And people shadow touch people, and it got beyond them. They didn't know what they were doing because they were moving in God's call. The most important thing for me is that right there, that you be touched by the Lord today. Beyond the message, beyond anything, you be touched by the anointing of God. And that we would somehow gel together and just say, God, do whatever you want in my life. I don't have to run my life anymore. You can run it. I'm sure that I should have built a lot more in God's kingdom than I've built. But you know, something in me is still saying, Lord, still have your way. Sorry, God, for the things that I've done. I've done many things on my own. Uh, uh, you know, like Peter, right, on the Mount of Transfiguration, we're all a lot like that. Are you guys glad you came to church today? We're all a lot like Peter. Peter got in the atmosphere, he got in the presence of God, but then he got back in himself. He got so excited that it was all Peter. <laughs> and the Peter was starting to overshadow the God, but he was there for God. It was Jesus' moment. And Peter starts saying, hey, this is great. We can make some booze and tabernacles and set ourselves up and organize ourselves so that we can make the most out of God. And what did God say? Shh. Peter, shut up, man. Peter, <laughs> be quiet. That atmosphere, that thing that God wants to do in us, you know, it's good to get excited about it, but it's more important to allow him to lead us into the excitement of it. You know what's wrong with us? We're so used to doing what we do that we're not sure what else to do. You guys are quiet today. <laughs> and we know how to talk about the things we used to do. You know, what we're doing is, is a movie, is, can compare it to a movie. Maybe a good example is a movie. We all like to go to the movies. And that's how it is described in the New Testament. You can do this this morning. Open your Bible with me to the book of Matthew, please. Go to the 13th chapter. I promise not to keep you here all day just long enough. And I want to talk to you about seeing what others don't, do not see, what other people don't see. So, Matthew chapter 13, notice what the Bible says right here, and I'll come back to the example. You know, you remember Jesus told a parable here, and there's 40 plus parables in the four Gospels that Jesus told, and this is how Jesus communicated the message of the kingdom. You might want to write that down, through parables. So before you think I'm just some crazy preacher, you know, that's idealistic, I want you to know right here, the whole God thing here is not going to always make sense. And you got to get your head wrapped around that so that you can get your head out of the way. Because sometimes we think it through so much that that's what, that's what the problem is. We're thinking, thinking, thinking. But Jesus told the story of the kingdom. He presented the kingdom of God into the earth. And that's really what the gospel is. It's the message of the kingdom. He presented that in ways where you, you had to almost get it from the inside. Are you here today? You couldn't think about it consciously. You also had to think about it subconsciously, or really, better word is spiritually. You had to think from the inside to get it, because if you just thought with your mind, you wouldn't get it. A lot of people didn't get it. So Jesus here is going to tell some parables in this chapter. In fact, there's eight of them here in this one 13th chapter. But the first one he told is the parable of the, the sower and the seed. And we're pretty familiar with that, but drop down to verse 10, and it says, as soon as he told it, his disciples came and did what we should do. They came and asked him, why do you use parables when you talk to the people? Listen to his reply. Not only did he tell parables, but he answered things kind of in symbols and strange language. Jesus replied, you are permitted to understand the secrets. Somebody say secrets. Well, I love that. You are permitted. I love that language. I'm permitted. Yeah, you're permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. 
To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, somebody say not listening. See, if you're not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. This is why I use parables. And he goes on and talks more about the prophecy of Isaiah and everything. So back to the, the example of it's the kingdom of God and us being a part of what God's doing in this thing called the church or the call. Uh, it's like a movie. And in the spectrum of movies, there's all different kinds. Some people like comedies. Some people like adventures. Some people like romances. You guys have the Hallmark Channel over here by any chance? You, you don't get that. Yeah. Good for the ladies. <laughs> we have a Hallmark Channel in America. It just tells the, all, the, all the movies ladies like with a good ending. Always has a positive ending. It's always going to end the same way. And my wife loves those kind of movies, and she just comes away feeling good. And, and uh, that's one kind of movie. I don't always enjoy that kind of movie as my favorite. But there's all these different kinds of movies. And, and every different kind of movie is, is good. It's made to touch a certain part of people. But I want you to know that the Bible seems to lean towards the movie that's playing out with us. Jesus is the head, we're his body. The movie that's playing out is a thriller. You don't know what's going to happen, really. You have an idea of what's going to happen. You put it together as it's happening. But so, so the, this thing that we're doing is a thriller. So, so take a minute and think about that. It's okay to not know everything. If, if you get okay with not knowing everything, it's easier to just kind of go with things. Not go blindly, but go blindly enough to go by faith. To not have to see everything that's happening or figure it out all, you know, all of it out in advance or anything like that. I mean, how many people just go from church to church to church today because they're looking for something? But the truth is, they don't know what they're looking for. <laughs> You're in the kingdom, man. You're not going to find it. You're not going to find what you're looking for. You're going to find what God is looking for you to be looking for. <laughs> I don't know, I just think this way, huh? This, I, I, this, God shows me this stuff. We're always thinking that, you know, we're going to find something, and we live our whole lives, and it's just like, like I said here a couple weeks ago, it's like sand, you know, sifting through our fingers. We're, we're like, we're not fulfilled. We're not satisfied. We haven't come up with, but you know, God's got your answer. God's the one that made you. God knows exactly where to take you along the way. Sometimes you're not going to enjoy everything. Sometimes you're going to go through some hard knocks. You're going to do the hard yards, like you guys say. Sometimes, because why? Because God's bringing you to a place. God's getting you somewhere. God knows how to do it. It's not always the way we want to do it, but the way he wants is best in the end. The whole story of what's going to happen with, in between Jesus first coming and Jesus coming back is the same thing. We, we see a lot of things, and there's a lot of things that we should be paying attention to, but there's a lot of other things that we have to be careful of or we'll get sidetracked. Read this again with me. Verse number 11. You are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. The word really there is, is mystery in the Greek. Mysterion is, is the word from which we get either mystery or secret, so secret works. We are permitted to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. So the first question I ask myself is, what if we don't understand? What will we miss if we don't look at the church with that kind of thriller movie mentality? Well, we're going to be surprised. How many people like to be surprised? See, in some things we do, and in some things we don't. How many people like to be surprised, though, in good things? Well, the Bible's got a lot of surprises for you. You didn't know what you'd be doing at a certain place in life, but then when you got there and all of a sudden you found out God did a few things, you're like pleasantly surprised. Most people thought I wouldn't amount to, to much. You know, I was just a juvenile delinquent kid uh, in a small town in the middle of America that, you know, that made mostly bad choices, didn't have a father. What's he going to do? Where's he going to go? I'm 50 years old today. I still go back to my hometown, and there's still people in my hometown looking at me like, I never thought you'd amount to anything. They usually say this to me, we knew you had it in you. We knew you had something on your life. There was something special on your life. I mean, teachers will say that to me. People will say that to me. But we just never thought, you know, you're always kind of inconsistent. Yeah, but that was just because of what I was dealing with in life. So looking back, I'm like, you know, I'm pleasantly surprised at where I'm at, uh, where I'm at today. How about you? 
Then there's the other parts of my life where I'm thinking, okay, God said this, God said that. Didn't happen in the time I thought it was. Sometimes I'm like, God, when's this ever going to happen? God likes us to stay in a state of ever following Him. That's the point. The world programs us. The Bible's very clear about steering clear of the world. I hope you're taking notes today. There's a few things for you to think about. Steering clear of the world, but, you know, in our own thinking, what happens is we start to think the world's okay because we interact with it all the time. We can't go out of the world, Paul said. We have to stay in the world. We, we can't just be homeschooled all the time and separated all the time and, and always a subset somewhere else all the time. That's not Christianity. We're in the world, but if we're not careful, we let the world do our thinking for us. And to the point where really today we're living in a church world where it's the programming of the world that's inside the church. More than the programming of the kingdom. When John the Baptist came introducing Jesus, he came saying, repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom up there is coming here. The kingdom in that other dimension where God rules and reigns is coming here. So get yourself ready. Get yourself in a position. Get your mind on God. Separate from the world. And a million people did. They came down from Jerusalem, down into the Jericho, down you know, in the lower parts uh, there off the Dead Sea. They, they made a long trek in that day to just come saying, God, with our actions, we, we want to get right with you. When Jesus came, He came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. It was the same message. When He sent the twelve, they went out and they preached what Jesus told them to preach, the gospel of the kingdom, the message of the kingdom. When He sent out the seventy, they preached the kingdom. When you get into the book of Acts and you see the church there in those beginning years, what were they preaching? They were preaching the kingdom. Paul went to Ephesus, one of the most dark cities in the ancient pagan world, and he stayed there and worked with 12 guys until every day he was preaching and teaching in the school, the health spa of Tyrannus. What was he doing? He was convincingly expounding and boldly declaring the things concerning the kingdom of God. We need to stay a little bit mysterious. That's what I'm trying to say today. I don't know if I'm saying it too well. It's okay to be mysterious. Don't lose the mystery of Christianity. Don't let your church become common. Don't go to church and just say, well, I want church to be this way. I want church to be that way. I think a couple of weeks ago, I might have shared this here. You know, the Satanists live by this creed, do what you will. But the Christian lives by a different creed, do what God wills. <laughs> Exemplified by Jesus that said, not my will, but your will be done. God if there's any way out of this Garden of Gethsemane, if there's any way out of going to the cross, if there's any way out of this, Lord, make a way. If there's any way, but not my way, your way. Where the call of God really comes out of a person's life when we finally shift past that. And sometimes we kind of go in and out of it. But I, I want you to know today, that's, that's the thing. If you really want God, you got to go for His way, His kingdom. Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. A lot of Christians are calling things God's will, but it's really our will again. It's okay for you to be mysterious a little bit. It's okay for your church to be. Church needs to be a place where people go, I'm not sure really what that's all about. They do do some strange things down there that I don't understand. You see, the church has allowed the New Age movement to come and just invade the Western world, man. I mean, the New Agers are more spiritual than the Christians today because of this very fact right here. But we can turn that around. There's a, you know, people have a, a want to in them to know what is going on deeper inside of me. What is it in me? What are these things that I sometimes perceive inside me? What is it that God wants to do in me? The Christians have a tendency to kind of stay over here, just, just keep everything even keel so that it makes it easy for the common person to come. But if you make it so easy for the common person to come, you're going to stay common. Uh oh, did I say that? If you make it, if you make your Christianity, if you build it around the things that you like and you're comfortable with, you're going to stay common. Hello? But Jesus didn't say we were permitted to stay common. He said we're permitted to have an inside view. We're permitted to see the secret things, the mysterious things, the things other people don't see, the things a lot of people don't want to see. You're permitted to see them. Wow. 
You know, the gifts of the Spirit, talking about the Holy Ghost, and, and man, so easy to come and be in, in uh, Pastor Neil's church, and, and because his anointing is easy to preach in, you know, but the gifts of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the way the Holy Spirit works, it works in a certain way. It doesn't work just because we decide we want it to work. That helps, but it works because we decide we want God's way. And then 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says it's as the Holy Spirit wills. It's as God wills. These manifestations happen. We've seen them. Most of us have seen all of them, right? We've seen these tremendous, miraculous things happen. But how do we have them happen? Not doing our thing, doing His thing. It's easier to preach than it is to do. But one thing we can do is just put one foot in front of another and go back to the Bible. It's as simple. How do we start? It's as simple as wanting to listen to Jesus' words. Listen, I said a minute ago to you that the world will program you. It'll program you through conscious information and subconscious information. And say, well, Pastor Rocky, how does that work? Well, consciously you understand, you know, just exchange of ideas and all that stuff. And Sometimes we feel really important when we know stuff. Don't we? The more I know, the more pride I have to be careful that I, I might have. And so, but we all enjoy the exchange of information, learning, growing, studying your Bible. You know, we have to use our mind. But then there's this other area, the subconscious area that is coming at you all the time. When you drive down a street here on Nicklin Way, you see billboard after billboard after sign. And most of those signs are, they're created in a way that will get your attention. Subliminal advertising is not anything new. It's something that started, you know, as far as I know, back in the, like the 50s when TVs first came around. They, they had to begin to create laws against using too much subliminal advertising. Why? Because it affects people and they don't know it. And so we live in a world where we, we watch TV, we go to the movies, we drive down Nicklin Way, we, we interact with each other on a level where I'm telling you about myself, you tell me about yourself. And if we're not careful, we're building a different kind of atmosphere than Pastor Neil's talking about. God wants us to build that other atmosphere. There's nothing wrong with living in the world, but you got to know the world is trying to program you. That's why you can't love the world. You can be in the world, but you can't be of the world. you got to be cautious. First John, be cautious of the world, man. Stay out of the world. You can't be God's friend and the world's friend. You can't. Not because God doesn't love you, because you're, you're getting in between two kinds, sources of information that will mold you and shape you into two different things. Listen, there's two things working together in the world today. And I've probably said this to you before, but there's, two, there's one basic battle. There's two basic forces. There's the mystery of iniquity that's working in the world that plays out all the way in the end, the book of Revelation. You see the, the, the harlot of Babylon there. That's the mystery of iniquity. It's working through the world system or programming. You're still glad you came to church today. It's not always, you know, nobody's kidnapping you and mind controlling you. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. That could happen, but I've been talking about that. I'm talking about just the world system set up so it's constantly trying to suggest things to you. And it's hoping to slip most things in so you don't catch them, so you don't do anything about them. But there's another thing that's working, and it's called Timothy. Paul uh, describes it in 1 Timothy. I wish we had time to go into all the scriptures, but you could do it. Just, just go through and look at all the scriptures that talk about the secret Jesus is talking about, the mystery of what we're doing here. And you'll see there's something called the mystery of godliness. And, and it started with, it really started before Jesus, but it, it was exemplified in Jesus. Jesus somehow, God, came to earth, took on a human body, but was God inside, showed us, taught us, illustrated for us how God moves around in this earth and the things that God wants us to do. And that right there, uh, you know, and then he ascended to the right hand of God, raised from the dead, died for our sins. And that thing right there is called the mystery of godliness. And that's in the atmosphere too here. And that thing's in the atmosphere, and it can be, it can be touched easily by a Christian and drawn from at any time. And then this other thing, the mystery of iniquity is working there, and it's coming to the cosmic clash of the end. That's what's happening. And we're living in a day-to-day -day where we're seeing this. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say to you today is let God have His way. It's not hard. Realize that the Bible is very similar in some ways. The devil stole all of his subliminal programming information from God. God makes us free moral agents and says, here's what I have for you. If you want to know, come and immerse yourself in my word. Come and immerse yourself in my spirit. 
And sometimes what happens is you'll read your Bible, right? And it'll seem like you're getting nothing from it. And you'll get up every morning and you'll have devotionals and you'll go day after day, week after week, and it'll seem like really not much is happening. You know, sometimes I get tired and bored with my Bible. <gasps> preachers do that, especially preachers, because they're in it more often. Sometimes it just seems like it's not doing anything. But I'm here to tell you, it is doing something. The Bible is always doing something because it's not just about information. It's also about subliminal programming. Symbolism is working on you. Jesus tells a parable and you're like, man, I'm not sure what that means, but it's working on you. A sower went out and sowed the seed and he sowed the seed in these four areas and these four areas of ground, they produce different kind of fruit. And you're like, oh, and think about it. And I'm 50 years old, like I said before, and I'm still getting revelation about what that means. Why? Because God made it that way. It's not just working on one level. It's working on at least a second level and probably hundreds of levels. God's doing more than we know that he's doing. So let's get excited about God moving. Sometimes we need to go back and pull some of the weeds out of our garden and remember what we're up to here. This is a mysterious thing and it's okay. It's a secret and it's okay. God wants it to be like that. Let me just, uh, let me give you a couple of examples here. Last month, you know, we had the whole September thing, and a lot of uh, Christians were thinking that some were thinking, you know, it might even be the end of the world. Some were thinking, you know, it might be a, this new phase in the end times that we're living in. It, you know, there was so much, so much swirling. But while that was going on, I, I came across this little fact. The word Shemitah, which John, in Jonathan's con there, the, uh, Khan's book, The Harbinger, I'm talking about the Jubilee years, if you know anything about that. That word, though, was the target at one point in one of ten Google searches. Isn't that amazing? The word Shemitah, just talking about the time, you know, the, the, the Jubilee year, the Shemitah year, and how that we're in a Shemitah year now, and how that it, it's meant for blessing, but it can also be turned for a curse, uh, particularly with the nation of Israel. But because of the book, The Harbinger, and the follow-up book to it, it became so famous in the world that everybody on Google, one in ten out of people that were going to Google and searching for something, were looking for that word. And I thought, isn't this amazing? We can create this much of a splash. We can make this much of an impact. But here in October, the world didn't end. You know, we're, we're still living in, in, the, in the end times, you know, and all that. But, you know, it wasn't this cataclysmic thing. And then we all move on to something else. Because, you see, that's man-made way. That's how man does it. You're all excited about something. And then there's nothing else to do except just kind of leave it behind and go to the next thing. But if we have that much power and influence in the world to get one in ten people going to Google to look at what we're talking about, then we should be talking about the right things. We should be talking about how great Jesus is, what Jesus has done, how people can get saved, how they can find their call, how God can build his kingdom, what God wants to do. We should be talking about these things with passion, with intensity. We should be writing more hit books. I understand it's not quite as easy because you're dealing with people. It's easy to get people excited about carnal things or soulish things than it is spiritual things, but we've got a lot of influence. Can you say amen? This other thing I thought about, just to give you an example of what I'm trying to communicate to you, the word meme. How many people have heard the word meme, M-E-M-E? -M -E? It's the thing on uh, social media where somebody will draw a picture or take a photograph and then put words in there. And Christians, we do it by putting scriptures there, putting God ideas there, and the photo helps draw you to the, the meaning of the subject, helps draw you into the word. So... Um, we, uh, Jordan and, and I and Bobby, we do an online church concept to help churches uh, called the Underground Church. So, uh, and it's been great. We've reached tens of thousands of people and uh, touched people's lives. And, you know, God's doing something and we think it's going to grow and we're excited about it. So in the, in the expanding of that, Jordan comes to me one day last year and says, you know, we need to do more memes. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> I thought she was speaking a foreign language. I'm like, what? Memes? What is that? It's just, oh, just these things, you know, and she showed me a couple of examples online of memes and advertising and things. And I said, oh, okay, that's cool, you know, pictures to communicate messages. That's great, let's do it. So, so she does memes, and a lot of the young people do memes, and, you know, they just, like I said before, they just reach so many young people on the internet through memes. So then back in April, we were invited with this underground church thing to go to the UN for this um, um, 
symposium on the, the persecuted church. And it was, a, it was a bizarre thing. The one, one thing the UN did was this little thing sponsored by the island of Palau through blackmail with money. That's the way the politicians would do it. The, the, the guys from Palau only did it because they were paid off. But the island of Palau sponsored a symposium in the United Nations in New York City on, on global persecution of Christians. It was just like a speck in the sea. Christians are getting their heads cut off, and it was just amazing how little Christians even have thought about these things in America anyway. And so we went there, and, and um, while we were there, I was interviewing one of the guys there for our program, and he started talking to me about memes and where they came from. And just talking about programming, how we can just accept ideas. We don't even know where they came from. And he said, oh, yeah, memes. That word meme, it comes from this atheist guy, Richard Dawkins, the British guy. He invented the word. See, I had no idea that an atheist evolutionist invented the word when my daughter came to me and said, this is great, let's do a meme. I didn't even investigate the word. Subconsciously, I just accepted it. Hey, it's a great idea, it's all good, looks good to me. You know, I didn't, I didn't do any in-depth research, and we just went with it, and I'm not saying you can't use it, but it's good to know what we're up to. Things can just get slipped in on us, and we're saying meme, 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 and we're talking about Jesus, but then we're also opening the door for worldly culture, worldly programming, mindsets. Everything the Bible says, the word breaks down and washes and transforms. And I realized right then, it's, it's very, very critical that we think towards God. All right? Let's do this just to close. I just want to give you a couple of examples of the word mystery in the New Testament to give you something to think and chew on this week. These are places in the New Testament where you can find them. I might just want to write them down real quickly. Um, let's see here. The word mystery is used in Romans 11, verse 25. And what it says there is it tells us not to be ignorant of the mystery of God. So Mark or Matthew chapter 13 rather said, we're given to know this. It's given for us to know. So we should want to know. And then Romans 11, 25 says, don't be ignorant of the mystery of God. Part of that mystery there is that it's a forming together of Jew and Gentile. So a bringing together of all mankind under the gospel banner in the earth. Don't be ignorant of it. Know about it, but it specifically calls it a mystery. Colossians chapter 1, verses 26 and 27 describe and define the mystery as Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's a mystery, but that's an amazing thing. We're carrying Christ, each of us, somehow, individually, in our inward man, but together, collectively, as His church, we're really carrying Christ. We are Christ, the Bible says, in the earth. Isn't that amazing? Romans chapter 16, verse 25 tells us to be established in the mystery. Be established in it. So don't just know a little bit about it, but give it some thought. You know, Don't just let it be surface reading, but do your research and do dig deeper and do make sure that you search to know the things of God and the mysterious and deeper things of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1 talks about our responsibility with the mystery. We have a responsibility to oversee its operation. So we have a responsibility this morning to not let church become common. We can't ever let it be. It's not just something we shouldn't do. It's something the Bible says don't do. Do not do it. Be responsible. Paul said, I was found faithful as a steward of the mysteries of God, of the mystery of the gospel of the kingdom of God. I was found faithful, and God uses me as a household overseer to build and to establish. That's how he became an apostle. 1 Corinthians 13 and 14 talk to us about the importance of prayer and how to interact with the mystery. What do you do with this sermon today? You can go pray about it. Hello? Hello? You can go read the Word this, tomorrow morning and start a devotional life that's a little stronger than it has been. That's going to help. And you can get in prayer about it. You can talk to God about it. You can purposefully pray in the Spirit about it. And if you pray in the Spirit, the Bible says you will be praying out mysteries and secrets. See, it's not just a concept, man. This is how we get that. Jesus said to His uh, disciples, don't go anywhere. Stay in the city of Jerusalem until you're what? 
clothed with power from on high. Until you touch that realm, until something's given out of that realm, until God's will is poured out and you touch that thing and something explosive is going to happen and it's going to change the world. But don't move until I say. And they stayed what? In prayer. What were they doing? They were interacting with God in the spirit realm. And it's a mechanical tool they could use to be in a position so that when God wanted to do something, they were ready to go. And I think today, most churches don't seem to even pray in tongues. In fact, prayer, I was telling Neil the other day, in America, has been relegated to 17 seconds by the average church on a Sunday morning service. We pray for 17 seconds. You guys prayed in worship form today for, I don't know, at least 30 or 40 minutes, right? But the average Christian today is just spending, you know, like, you know, praying this really meaningless, quick prayer and going on about their business, and we're still calling ourselves Christians. So be careful. In fact, there's two major prayers in your Bible, Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 3, where Paul gives you an example of how to pray in the kingdom. How to pray and stay in touch with the secret things of God. Check those out. Ephesians 1.15, Ephesians 3.14. You'll find both chapters talk about the mystery, then they go into the prayer of Paul. Paul says, pray like this. I love that one in Ephesians chapter 1. Pray like this. I'm praying that God would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, that you would know Him, that you would have a deeper, meaningful relationship with God, and that you would know Him, and as you begin to know Him, you begin to understand the importance of the person sitting next to you. Because God's working in me, He's working in you, and you, and you, and you, God's doing something, and the people of God are very valuable to God, and we need a spirit of wisdom and revelation to even understand that. You're not just somebody I go to church with. You're somebody that we're changing the world with. We're changing the world here in Kiwana with each other. We are repositories and deposits for the Holy Ghost and power and fire. We are what God is using. But we have to remember what we're up to. We have to be willing to. This is the prayer Paul is praying. I pray that God would give you the ability to touch this, to know what you're one called to do, to know two who's called with you to do it, and to know three, the exceeding greatness of the power God will give you to do it. Wow! What kind of power is that? It's the same power that raised Christ from the dead because that's how Jesus went about it. He went about it, not my will, but your will, and the same power worked in Him, and it exploded into thousands and millions and today billions of lives. Because of that, if we're responsible with the mystery the, and we're establishing the mystery, that mystery will establish other people. It'll break out. You can't contain it. We don't have to make it happen. It'll happen. The mystery has to do in your Bible. Ephesians 3 talks about the fellowship of the mystery. We're actually, by coming together today, we're teaching, the Bible says, principalities and powers spiritual forces in the heavenly realms, both good and bad, we are teaching them, God's using us as a teaching manual. He's saying, look what I do with them, man. You guys think you're all that, all you fallen angels and principalities and powers that went with the devil and did your own thing. Look what you missed out on. Look what I can do. I don't need somebody that has everything. I can take somebody that has nothing and I can do many things through their lives. I can take a group of people that barely know what they're doing together and I can cause an explosion of the kingdom anywhere at any time. The fellowship is something you can do about it. Never come to church again and say, I'm oh, just going to church. Come to the call. Come to the meeting of the kingdom. I'd like to have an Ephesians right here in the Sunshine Coast. An Ephesus explosion. Where all of a sudden we're like, I don't know how it exploded out of this hell spa, but it got into all, not only of the city, but all of the state of Queensland. That's what happened in Acts 19. It went into the whole region, maybe of the east coast of Australia. They could not reel it back in. That's what I'm looking for. Not something we can fish with and control. Something we can't get in. Man, we caught something we can't reel in. We don't know what to do. Only God can finish. Only God can do it. Hallelujah. Let's stand up together this morning. Father God, we thank you today for your anointing. Lord, let it break every yoke of bondage. If you're dealing with anything in your life today, any, it could just be something that you consider to be small. 
inconsequential. But if there's any sticking point in your life, I, I want you to believe God. I want to believe God with you for the smashing and the breaking through of those things. See, if there's any area in our life that's a blockage to God, we just haven't known it, let's, let's just open our heart and say, God, you can have it. You could take it. In Jesus' name, Lord, I open my life to you. Come on, Father God, we just plead the blood of Jesus over our lives and over this church service right now. Just come in and work on every heart, Father. Let the kingdom do its work. Let the Spirit of God, the, the vessel, the agent of change, work deeply in every heart right now and smash every stronghold. In Jesus' name. It's not by strength, it's not by, by power, but it's by my Spirit, says the Lord. It's the anointing, the Bible says, that destroys the yoke of bondage. Come on, open your life to Him today. God, do what you will. Come on, put your hands up with me right now. Hallelujah. Come on, just build that atmosphere. Enter into that atmosphere. Hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus, present yourselves living sacrifices. Bring the sacrifice of praise. These are things the Bible says you can do about it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Listen to me. I want to give this call before I turn it over to Neil. If there's anybody in this room today, you've never given your life to Jesus. He's the only way into the kingdom. You've never turned your life over to him, but you want to do that. I'm going to give you the opportunity right now before we go. You say, Pastor Rocky, I want to get saved. I want Jesus to save me and take control of my life. Is there anybody in here like that? I've never been saved, but I want to give my life to Jesus. Maybe the Lord's dealing with your heart right now. Just put your hand up. Let me see it. Anybody says, I want to give my life to Jesus today.